Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 21. We have looked at what forgiveness is, the truth of forgiveness. Uh, we've looked at how forgiveness works in the action of forgiveness. Uh, we've looked at when we should forgive. Uh, and this morning we're going to look at something why we should forgive. That only leaves one more question to ask, and next week will be the where, God willing. But this morning we'll be looking at the why. Uh, within these verses there are those which refer to what we're going to look at this morning, but it's always good to read these portions of God's Word. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount, which Jesus uh, declared. It's still considered today, even by writers in the world today, as one of the greatest oratories amongst humankind. That's quite a statement, isn't it? Matthew 5, verse 21. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of counsel. And whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Uh, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar, and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly, while you're on the way with him. Lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Surely I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. And you have heard that it was said of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her, has commi already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, then pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that your, one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces a wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Again, I should say, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, nor for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no be no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. And you've heard it said, it said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you to resist the evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to it, the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go to, with him too. And give to him who asks and from him who wants to borrow uh, from you, do not turn away. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what more do you do than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that this morning we have been able to come and to worship you, to praise you, and Lord, to pray to you. Lord, our 
familiarity with you is a wonderful, tremendous privilege. Lord, sometimes familiarity can breed contempt. Lord, sometimes we take for advantage of our situation of immediate access into your presence and disregard, Lord, others' access to ourselves. Lord, it hinders our relationship to you and we do not always realize it. Lord, help us this morning as we look into your word to see, Lord, what you have to say about why we should forgive. And that, Lord, you would continue to change us. That, Lord, we might better reflect the forgiveness of God to those around us. And, Lord, that we would know greater assurance of our own forgiveness as, Lord, we learn to forgive others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We may know the truth of forgiveness as we are considering it through these weeks. And we may have experienced the action of God's forgiveness in our life. Some change has occurred as a result of being forgiven. Our gratitude to God. We may even realize that we are to forgive and have that when in mind. But there is a danger that lurks in our hearts. We love to be forgiven, but we don't always want to forgive. On the 8th of January, 1956, I don't personally remember it, but some of you do, a group of missionaries walked onto a beach in Ecuador where two days earlier they'd sat down and chatted with a local group of tribes, people, just free individuals from a local tribe. They'd been seeking to reach out to them for months by dropping down to them buckets of of love, and that's their description of them, as gifts. And they hoped that the people there would get the idea that these people in this plane were loving people and caring people, and people that could be trusted, because this tribe had a reputation of trusting nobody. They'd recently killed quite a number of shell oil workers in the area, and they had a, a, a murdering intent uh, in their, their hearts. In fact, if you lived in that tribe in those days, it was 60, there was a 60% death rate of those killed either by fellow tribe members or in battles with other tribes. They were a warlike people. They were called the uh, Aku. I can't, I can't even say it. Wandi is how they say it today. At the end of the day, when those five men walked onto that beach and left their plane, they were dead. The spears of those tribesmen had been driven through them. And one of those men was called Minkawe. That was his name. Now I wonder, would you forgive him? He's just taken away a husband, father of a young child. Would you want to forgive him? As we read through the verses and the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, we find that forgiveness is connected to forgiving. Now, the originality of forgiveness with us has nothing to do with ourselves. Actually, it is God who forgives us. He takes down the barrier between humanity and himself, our sins, and removes it, and shows himself to us. Where we have built a barrier against him, he destroys and undermines that by forgiving he turns us to face him. But in our lives as Christians, knowing the forgiveness of God, sometimes we rebuild barriers, barriers between individuals. But Jesus taught that this forgiveness is connected to forgiving. It was a fundamental part of these missionaries' message to preach forgiveness, to preach that God forgives sinners. He removes the barriers. But it was this message that caused these men to yield their lives. They became known as martyrs. At the age of eight, the little boy who lost his father was called Steve. His mum received a phone call from his dad's sister, Rachel. She rang to ask an incredible thing of her sister-in-law. Please, will you let me take your son 
my brother's son, into that tribe of people where, from whom your brother was killed. Because those people have become, begun to know what it means to be a Christian. And the man who killed your husband and my brother has promised that he will personally take responsibility for him. What an incredible transformation. But how difficult it was for that lady to forgive. In 1996, there was a film produced at the end of the spear, and in two hours they condensed 50 years of the message of forgiveness that had been at work in that tribe of people. See, forgiveness has no boundaries. There is no wall it cannot bring down. Even if the perpetrator will not accept that forgiveness, forgiveness itself is able to take down the barrier in order to give the opportunity for reconciliation and in God's case, atonement for all our sin. So how do we know why we should forgive other people? What on earth could drive us to do that? Now, it's easy to do it, maybe, when someone's just cut you up in the car park at Tesco's or Asda or whichever other supermarket you want to use, or taken that trolley that you had your eye on and they take it from you, or that last bottle of drink has disappeared from the shelf and you wanted that one. You've been waiting to get that. What about when it's something that's life-changing? where an action happens that cannot be taken back, that cannot be taken out of the mind in this life. How do we forgive? Why would we forgive? Well, forgiveness, as we see in the Word of God this morning, has a significant correlation which we should be mindful of. And that will lead us to think about the influential compassion which of course is what forgiveness is in its original form. It is God's compassion in mercy. Uh, it, without God, there would be no forgiveness. There would be no grounds for it. There would be no understanding of it. It is his compassion. So forgiveness has a significant correlation. And here it is in the Lord's Prayer in chapter 6, the same sermon of Jesus. Forgive us as we forgive those Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Or to use Luke's words, forgive us our transgressions as we forgive those who transgress against us. As I explained to you last week, there are two words that are used in Jesus' prayer to represent our sins. We cross a line with, trans, with trespasses uh, or transgressions. We incur debt in occurrence with our sins. But Jesus earlier speaks about a correlation. And he describes in verse 21 of, it's not verse 21, sorry, verse 23 in the first part of verse 23 of chapter 5 of Matthew, a man. And it's the man who's coming to the temple and he has with him a gift. Probably a lamb or a goat or maybe a pigeon he is bringing. And he is bringing an offering. And this offering is coming to God. He has come to the temple to offer this offering to God. He is a man who is thankful for forgiveness. It is his motivation for coming to the temple. He has an offering to bring because he is grateful to God for what it means to be forgiven. It may be a free, uh, two different types of offering in particular. It may be that this is an offering for sin. He is bringing this gift to God in, in place of his own sin. God, as this animal dies, I lay my hand on its head of the sheep, and I want you, Lord, to transfer my guilt to this offering, knowing, Lord, that this offering won't pay the debt of my sin, but you will. You will cover the debt of my sin. You will atone for my sin. And he comes in thankfulness, offering an animal for his own sin. That's gratitude, isn't it? That God is willing to forgive me. 
That is, I know it's not the animal, but I know it's God who will forgive me. He's asked me to come this way because without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. And there can be nothing dealt with, but I know I am forgiven. He's a grateful man. But the other way he may be coming also is a thanksgiving offering. He may be bringing a thanksgiving offering to God because of the birth of a new child. And he is grateful unto God for the gift and provision of the safe arrival of this child. And he is rejoicing in this child. You have created within my wife's womb a a wonderful gift to me. And I give you praise, God, because you have made this child. And I thank you. Or I thank you, Lord, because you have given me crops to eat again this year. And I bring you the first fruit of my offerings to you. And I bring you, Lord, that which you have asked of me. And I praise you. Because there is a relationship between me and you, God. And you have removed my sin in order to bless me and to help me. And I thank you, God. I have a relationship with you. See, this man values his communion with God. But the second part as we move through this is that not only this man, a man who's thankful for the forgiveness of God, which has brought him a relationship with God, he is a man who is withholding forgiveness from others. As he approaches to offer his offering, Jesus tells us that this man may remember that his brother has something against him. That he has a grievance against him. Now there are various ways that this may be worked out. And the most obvious way is that this man remembers that he has sinned against someone. And here he is asking God to forgive him And he hasn't sought forgiveness from the one he has offended. And how can he ask God for forgiveness when he hasn't done the very basic thing of going to his brother and saying to him, I'm sorry for what I have done to you. I I will try and attempt never to do that again. Please forgive me. But come to God and say, please forget everything I ever did and just wipe that away. No, he must go back he must seek uh, that forgiveness. He, he, has done, he has sinned in his life. He knows what he has done. But there is another occasion which is also found within the words, and commentators argue about this with their pens, as commentators do, of an individual who has a grievance against you, but it has no basis whatsoever. And that too may be true. The person is grieved because they assume you have done something which you have not done. And you become aware of their grievance against you and, and their words and they keep telling everyone how you've hurt them and you didn't hurt them at all and they totally misread the situation. And you're going towards this altar as this man was and he, he turns around and he goes to that person and he says to them, look, I'm sorry you're grieved against me. I understand why you are grieved against me. I didn't do it, but please forgive me anyway. He seeks to put these things right before he comes to that altar. Why is he doing this? Well, how can I ask God to forgive me? If I know that someone is still going to hold that sin against me and plead that sin against me, this man deals with this issue because he realizes the provision of forgiveness comes from God. Jesus says that the man should first be reconciled to his brother. He should get things right with others. And this is where the world's view of forgiveness differs from that of biblical forgiveness. See, the world's view, and you can read the definitions of forgiveness for yourself, you will find that it tells you that forgiveness takes down the barrier, but there's no need to make reconciliation. But biblical forgiveness means nothing without reconciliation. If God only takes away our sin so that he may look upon us and we may pray to him, but we never seek to be reconciled to him, then what we occurred in our reading last week, that sin will come back on us because it has never been dealt with. But reconciliation is so important that our relationship with God is restored and is brought together. Forgiveness and reconciliation go together. If you forgive, says Jesus, at the end of the Lord's Prayer, and you can look at these verses in verses 14 and 15 of chapter 6, 
Jesus says this at the end of the Lord's his prayer that he's taught his disciples, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your Father will forgive you, you also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Why should I forgive? If I don't forgive, then I have no right to expect forgiveness. Even though God has demonstrated, shown me his forgiveness in the cross, he has taken down that wall and that barrier, if I have not the appreciation of that forgiveness, that means I can forgive those who have sinned against me. Then why should God forgive me? Now, there are many who go out on a Friday night to find their place to a way to a place where they can be forgiven. And they will go and they will ask and be told how many words to say or how many deeds to do in order to be forgiven. And then they will go out immediately and they will sin because they wanted a clean slate before they dirtied the slate again. This is not the biblical view of forgiveness. We come to a God who will forgive those who understand what it is to be forgiven and to forgive others. So there we have our significant correlation. Forgive me as I forgive those who sin against me. Forgiveness also then has an influential, influential compassion. Sorry, that sounded terrible to Hillary as I was bringing that out. Influential uh, compassion. Forgive us as we forgive. Let me say this to Christians this morning. We are brethren. I know that word in these days has a different meaning and context, but it's a biblical word and it's an important word to understand. It means we are of one flesh, of one bone. It's our families are our brethren. They were born of our same descendants. They are our brethren. As Christians, we are brethren. We are born of Go of God, we are born by the Holy Spirit, we are one in Christ. You did not choose your parents, they certainly didn't choose you, but you have been born to them. God chose you, he has called you to himself. We are the children of God, we cannot change that. And I hope that you don't want to change that. that we are the children of God. This is an influential compassion then. We have all known the love of God in our lives. And it's not just a past thing, is it? It is a present experience which we know. But sometimes family can get in the way of forgiving our brethren. There are those who have such a close relationship to their individual family, that by which they are entitled in their name, that they are unwilling to forgive their brother and sister in Christ. It's amazing how many people take offense because of Uncle so-and-so many years ago who wasn't allowed to be a deacon. I don't know the reason he wasn't allowed to be a deacon, but he wasn't allowed to be a deacon. And now the family has taken on bridge and they will no longer be mixing with those other people. And if there's ever a vote, we will vote against it because family. It's a ridiculous situation, but it's a true situation. Because family gets in the way. But we are the children of God. What is our nearest and dearest? What is our closest bond to one another? Now, by appearances, it is that, that of flesh. But that is not true, is it? What is the most intimate bond a human being can know? It is not between a husband and wife. It is between God and ourselves. The two can become one flesh in marriage. But with God, we become one spirit as his spirit dwells within us to change, to transform, and to commune with us. To speak to our wives if they're a distance from us, we have to take up a phone. Still have to do that today. To speak to our Heavenly Father, we simply have to utter a thought. And he will hear and he will heed. It is our nearest and closest relationship then to one another that we are Christians. And we should not let 
other boundaries of family get in the way. We are brethren. Now, we all want our families to come and know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, don't we? Because we recognize our closest bond is the lasting bond. It is the eternal bond. This is your family forever. These are the people of God who you're going to be living with forever. And I trust you believe that we shall all be changed. Therefore, if you have to forgive them seven times a day, as Peter is told in another place, uh, therefore cope with it. Because one day they'll be changed and all the forgiveness will be worth it. We have also recognized we're not only family. It should be influential in our lives. It should give us compassion as our fathers and mothers had compassion for us. And we trust our brothers and sisters physically too would forgive us if we sinned against them. We have also known what it is to be forgiven. And that's an amazing thing. It's why this, this subject is so important, because this word has been ruined in our culture and in our time to flippantly be a word. But forgiveness is an amazing thing. That God in his infinite holiness, with a more perfect ma- memory than we can imagine, who remembers every thought, word, and deed that we have done, and knows more intimately our sin than anyone else could ever know, has undermined it by forgiving it. And it's not a priest or an individual person who comes to us and says, you are forgiven, that gives us great comfort and joy this morning. It is the fact that God himself has done so. And some of us have still got memories of those sins that God has forgiven. And we remember what lives we used to live. And we remember the guilt that we were under. And we remember all those things, but we know we are forgiven. And it is a tremendous thing. We also recognize that though we have forgiven, we are also being forgiven. But none of us can expect to get through today without sinning. Nobody knows who they're going to see on the road on the way back that's going to cause them to breathe a word under their, uh, under their voice that they will never uh, have thought they would utter. As that person pulls out on you in the roundabout and you think, Argh! Or you don't know if you're going to the shop tomorrow morning and then somebody else is coming along and they, they stop you and they interrupt your day and you think, oh, I just wanted to get on with things. It just takes a little thing, doesn't it? Or something you see, something you hear. But we all know we're going to need forgiving. We all know that we're going to have to pray to God again, Lord, forgive me my sin. Please Help me never to do that again, but we know in our weakness that we are liable to sin. And therefore, we are so blessed because we know that God will forgive us. He will never, ever turn us away. And we don't want to return to the separation we had from God. You don't, do you? Do you ever want to go for a day where you can't pray? You may go for a day where you don't feel like praying, but what I mean is, do you ever want to come to a point where there's something crisis comes into your life, and maybe you haven't been the greatest prayer in the world, and you can't pray? Knowing that God will hear? You want to come to the place? God says, I don't know you. No, we don't. The one relationship we value above all others, we may not treat it as well as we should, but yes, we value it, is knowing God as our Savior, our Lord, but as the Lord's Prayer begins, as our Father in heaven. God has called us his, uh, his, our Father. He has allowed us to call him most intimately as the Holy Spirit enters into our heart, Daddy. And he tells us in comparison to that, call no one Father on earth because of the intimacy of the relationship I have with you. Do you want to return to where you were? Do you want to come to that place where you prayed but you just knew you weren't being listened to? Where you strive to come to salvation, yet you could not work it? But then God revealed it? No, of course not. We value being forgiven. We value our relationship with God. 
But the people you are thinking about not forgiving, they may have no forgiveness. They are stricken by the effects of sin. They sin all the time, they say sorry for it, but they never know a peace. Their dreams haunt them. But unlike us, when our nightmares occur, reminding us of our sin, we can turn to God and say, praise you that you have forgiven it and cleansed it, but they have nowhere to turn and nowhere to go to. Their families break apart, but there is no glue to put it back together. And these are the people that sometimes we feel we shouldn't forgive. They don't know God. They don't love God. They're, as Jesus calls them, enemies. Some of them persecute us. Some of them revile us. What is the greatest blessing that such a person can receive? Is it not the witness of Christ in forgiveness? They may not have yet seen what the Bible tells us of forgiveness, taking away our sins, but they can glimpse it in part when you approach. When you forgive, you just take a little brick out of the wall that shows them that their sins can be forgiven. All they've ever known is that sin hurts, wounds, breaks, ruins. And sin will eventually lay such a burden on them, to use the words of John Bunyan, which will take them lower than the grave itself into hell. But you show them that it doesn't need to be like that. But as long as you do not forgive, you act as a messenger of Satan reminding them only of the awfulness of sin. Others are imprisoned by the guilt of their sin. You think of that man who murdered that missionary. How long did he suffer under the burden of his sin? There are those who know no forgiveness. They need to know that the God releases the prisoner. <coughs> he breaks the bars. He enters into the cell and he leads the prisoner out. Wesley has a line in one of his hymns, No condemnation now I dread. He breaks the power of another hymn. He breaks the power of cancelled sin. He sets the prisoner free. He speaks of a prisoner given that life sentence, given that death penalty, bound in a prison cell because the heinousness of their crime means that they must not only be separated from humanity, they must be separated from life itself. And God comes. God forgives. And the sins are as scarlet. And the wounds are hideous. They lay hold of the cell and he breaks it apart. They have no forgiveness. How awful it is to be in a prison cell. And yes, they're there rightly. The crime they have done has brought them to that place. But how terrible it is to come to that place and know that one day I will leave this place and I will go somewhere far, far worse. And to be so burdened by that and so impressed by that as to be driven into hell itself by the thoughts of sin. They have no forgiveness. Some of us want to rejoice and dance on their graves and say, Oh, that's great, they're getting what they deserved. But my dear friend, that's where you were. You did not murder, you did not commit, commit one of these heinous crimes. No, you did worse. You offended a holy God in whose presence no sin can abide ever. You offended not only a holy God, you offended an eternal God. He cannot forget your sin. He has a perfect memory. He remembers all the time the guilt that we have and the things that we have. 
But he has chosen to remove that. Now he does it perfectly, thankfully. And you and I can't do that. Because as much as we forgive people, unfortunately our memory will bring back to remembrance the things they've done. So we will need to be reminded of the perfect memory of God again, in which he chose to forget by placing his son between us and our sin and laying the burden on him. And every time he looks at him, he thinks of us and the perfection and the beauty and the wonder that he sees displayed in us through Christ. Why should we forgive? Because we have been forgiven with an immeasurable, immeasurably wonderful gift. And how can we say that we are forgiven and value forgiveness and the unity of the relationship we have with God if we are not prepared to let others hear from our lips the forgiveness that is but small and minuscule in comparison with this. My dear friends, they need to hear the forgiveness of God. There is nothing in the Bible that says that they cannot be forgiven. There is only one sin which is unforgivable. It is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Surely it would be blasphemy to continue on in a manner which we know to be wrong against God in not forgiving those who sin against us. Your Father in heaven will also forgive you. How lovely that is. How lovely to stand with a, a person who feels the heap of their sin and the weight of their sin and say to them, so your Father in heaven will forgive you. Will forgive you. But I would say this in, in applying this just here briefly. We need to resolve forgiveness. Resolve to forgive sin when God brings it to our remembrance. We don't know what will happen next Sunday morning. You're coming to church and you're coming to worship God and to honor God and do. And he brings something to remembrance. Deal with it then. Some of these people we can't find anymore. We don't know who, where they are, but we need to ask God's forgiveness in that moment, that he will forgive us, that he will cleanse us and Somehow he will convey maybe to that person that we have forgiven, that they will not hold that as their hindrance in coming to know God. Some things we can't deal with, we have to find another way of doing. But some people, maybe we have to deal with it there and then. As a Christian, I've learned that sometimes I feel guilty for things I've not done, and most frequently, just after the service or going home on a Sunday as a preacher, you will often be made to feel guilty for things you haven't done. Sometimes I've asked people to forgive them, and they go, I didn't even think about it or consider it, but I needed to get it off my mind and off my heart. It was a hindrance. We need to deal with these things. But let this be said also. Do not let Satan turn this into a sin hunt. We are not to go raking through the garbage of our lives looking for an unforgiven sin. We are not to go into our wardrobes looking for the skeletons and hiding, looking in the cobwebs of the corners to find something somewhere we have not been forgiven for. We are not to let Satan use this against us. We are to use the cross against him. We are to uphold the cross before him and remind him that Christ died for all our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. And it's not his business to condemn us anymore. Paul was told, though, that lest he should become exalted in this above all measure, by the abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger from Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will most gladly boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. There are those things 
which is in the poor Apostle Paul's memory and mind, were a great blemish to his thoughts and he wished he could take them back. I don't know if he personally locked the prison doors of those who he arrested to be condemned and tried as Christians, but if he had, he would have heard those in his night sleep. He would have heard the pleading of wives as their husbands were taken away, or the cries of children as they were separated from their parents. And he would have wished that he could have taken it back. And I'm sure, in part, this is what Paul means by the thorn in the flesh, because it's exactly what God, uh, Satan, sometimes is allowed to do to us. And we hear cries, and we hear sounds, and we remember things, and we see them so plainly. But we need to hear this. My grace is sufficient for you. If we weren't reminded of our sins and the things we have done at times, we would not appreciate the grace of God as we do. And we would also be very, very tempted, and we would be exalted in our own minds of how holy we are. But because we cannot yet see God, sometimes we need the reminder that we are not as holy as we think we are. And we are utterly dependent on the grace of God. We are sinners saved by grace. It is the only difference between the sinners around us and ourselves. It is the grace of God. For there, by the, but for the grace of God, go I. Remember that man, McKenney? I'm sure as he has lived these years with Steve, the son of that missionary, he has often looked at that boy and seen his dad. How wonderful to know that they are reconciled, those two. They're brothers in Christ. May we know that same reconciliation amongst us that God has brought us in forgiveness. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that it's you who teaches us to pray. And Lord, we're not left to make up our own ideas and ways to pray, though we could come up with a multitude of plans and schedules for it. But Lord, you simply laid it out in your Son. We should pray to our Father in heaven, and we thank you, Lord, for letting us call you that. But Lord, we are given the most intimate relationship with you. Though you command everything, and everything is in your hand, Lord, we can call you our Father. Knowing, Lord, that everything is, is dealt with and done. We can pray, Lord, for your protection from the evil one. Thank you, Lord, most of all, we can pray to you for our forgiveness, knowing that you've already forgiven us. But help us, Lord, to forgive those who are dead us to us, who have transgressed against us, who have sinned against us. Help us to forgive them, Lord, in the light of your forgiveness. And help us, Lord, not to take for granted your forgiveness and not to withhold it. We pray, Lord, for any here this morning who are under a burden of their own sin because other people won't forgive them. Lord, you will show them your grace, your mercy, in spite of the bad actions and the sinful actions of even their brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray.